seated. Praise the Lord. And he is great. It is good to see you this morning. You're looking so handsome and pretty and all those other things. Oh, well, thank you so much. That had to be Mercy. Mercy can say that because she can't see as good as she used to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you came to church today? You know, last week we finished the book of Philippians, but I'm going to continue with a little bit of what we talked about. In fact, some of you are going to learn something new today. Some of you are going to find something old and find something new in it. And some of you are going to go out here shaking your head. <laughs> But what I want to share with you today is something that's really has been a controversial issue uh, among some leaders and teachers and preachers in regard uh, to this topic today and concerning this issue of law and grace. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I don't tithe because it's on the law or it's in the Old Testament. Others say, well, you know, it's, we should tithe because it's in the, it's in the Bible. And, you know, it's a, I just I want to answer some questions about that. About, in fact, I'm going to give you five points, I think, that will revolutionize your thinking in regard to this. At least get you thinking about some things that maybe you hadn't seen before. This is something that really, it was 15 years ago when God really began to unlock this to me. This is not what I, as a, as a Christian, I'd heard this as a child about tithing. But praise God, uh, I was around some deeper men of God when I got saved and gave my life to Jesus who taught me about a step beyond this, but uh, about what real spirit filled giving is. But I believe that many people miss this. There's a premise here. There's, there's a starting point here that I think you need to be aware of that, that makes very clear law or grace, whatever, that we are all to be givers. And I think that the Old Testament gives us a very clear indication of where our starting point at least ought to be. I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a spirit-filled giver. And if you looked at their giving statement, you'd say, you know, what spirit? And uh, <laughs> where are you coming from with that? And uh, who are you giving? Where are you giving? Uh, I do want to say that as you see that big word, the tithe up there, that word tithe is not a cuss word. Uh, it's always amazing. We, we prepare every year for marriage retreats and conferences that we do in, in, uh, in, our, in our church. And we have these great conferences every year on marriage. But uh, no matter who you read after in, in, in preparation for marriage seminars and counseling, all these things, they tell you, whether, and it's whether it's secular or, 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 or Christian, they all say there's five major conflicts that occur in every home. And these are the top major five conflicts and that, that most couples will fight over or argue about. Uh, the first one, and these aren't in any specific order, but to mention is that children, you know, how are we going to deal with children? How are we going to raise children? Discipline, all those issues regarding our children. The second problem is, uh, has to do with in-laws. No, please don't say amen if they're here. You know, uh, you know, a relationship to in-laws and how they affect the family and the present family and all that's going on there. How do, how do we respond in that regard? The third issue, which most psychologists talk to you about and even Christian counselors will talk to you about is in the area of communication. Just learning how to relate to one another and really speak to each other where it's not, you know, in a way that's threatening or whatever, opening up and sharing who you really are in your heart about issues. The, another major problem is in the area of your sexual relationships as a, as a man and a wife. The number one area out of the five is this one that we're going to talk about is money. That the number one cause of conflict in most marriages is money. How are we going to deal with it? Where are we going to spend it? How are we going to allocate it? How's the budget going to be? And what, if, listen, if that's a major problem in your home, then you ought to get some answers. And instead of couples getting conflicts about issues, money or whatever it is, it's amazing they're just going for years and years and years and never resolve the problem. Because one reason or the other, someone doesn't want to adhere to it or believe it or trust it, whatever it might be, they never solve the problem. Of course, you know, if they have a toothache, they're going to go to the dentist that day. You know, they're, they're going to deal with the problem. And I believe that there's issues in our life the Bible obviously has answers to, and this is one of them. When you realize that in the New Testament alone, about one ever six verses in the gospel has to do with something about stewardship and how we relate to the possessions that are in our life. 16 of the 29 parables that Jesus gave had to do with stewardship and how we handle the blessings of God and what we do with what God has given to us. And so it's important that we spend more than just one sermon, I believe, a year in talking about these things. And you know, if you go back and look at, uh, I make a, a list of everything I preach over the year. And I think last year I, I spoke about this issue one time. This year, this will be the second time that we've dealt with this issue. But I think if the Bible has so much to say about it, I probably ought to be preaching more than two sermons a year on it. So forgive me for not doing it more often. 
because it is something that even if we are being submissive in and learning the truths about, it's something we need to be reminded of and something we need to stay in, in contact with biblical principles and how they apply to our life, especially in this area. I did see a recent study, where's my little weather map thing here, in, uh, in about the typical church in regard to giving, it stated this, that 25% of the average congregation gives 90% of the weekly offerings that come into the church. In other words, 25% of us in this room will be the ones who are supporting 90% of what goes on around here and the ministries that take place and the work that takes place. Now to me, that's, that's phenomenal. I think it's a little better at believers, uh, although I haven't run those records independently myself. Within that group of 25%, the top 5% of that 25% give 50% of that 90. 50% of the church's income comes from that top 5% of givers. Uh, to me, that's just amazing. The remaining 20% of the 25%, they give the other 40%. 70% of the typical congregation in America contributes 5% of the incoming dollars. As only 5% is coming in from that group of 70%. That's amazing. I read it in another article that breaks it more down like this in, in simpler terms, that nearly three fourths of the American church attenders drop about a buck a week in the offering plate. Oh me or oh me. <laughs> but you know, one of the greatest and most important principles that we learn in, in, in our Christian walk in life has to do this issue. Now, now, when I first learned it, you know, I'd just recently gotten saved. My Phil, my brother led me to the Lord and we went to hear some preachers and teachers who were men of faith and men of God who were teaching on this issue. Now we're poor, all right, by anybody's standard at this point in our life and ministries. You know, I, I'm working with him. I won't even tell you the disgusting amount he paid me. <laughs> so it's not too embarrassing in front of everybody. But he wasn't making any more than that, all right? So it was pretty much equal pay across the board. Not much of anything. You know, somebody asked me, Don't, do you ever eat those Jack in the Box tacos? I said, I eat them for three years every day. I hate them. <laughs> 99 cents, two tacos. That was lunch, dinner, whatever it took. All right. We, there was a nearby Jack in the Box, wasn't there, we, we hit there often and, and, and made it occasionally into the Jack in the Box, like daily. All right. But we learned these principles. When we came home after hearing these sermons about giving and what it really meant to be a giver, we didn't have much to give away. We started giving what we had away. And I remember one of the greatest needs that Phil's ministry was facing at that time was a location because of what God was doing and the blessings that God was bringing. And you know, within just days of us beginning to learn how to give and give like that, we had a, a knock on the door that came from a, 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 a Quaker pastor, a friend's church in the area that said they had a facility in a building they were no longer using. Want to know if, you know, he was saying it in tears because God was leading him to do this and their church do this. And it was a big step of faith for them. We were just learning about big steps of faith and all of a sudden God opens the door for a whole building and the facilities and all the things that need to be done. That was just the beginning of a journey, all right? That, that began to teach you know, me and others around this time about what it really meant to be a giver and what living giving really is. And how to, you know, that you, you live to give and you give to live, how all that works together. But I, I did realize as I, especially as I began the church, there were so many people that number one, hadn't been exposed to it, but hadn't been exposed to some of the simple, and I really believe some of the things I'll share you today are really profound truths from scripture, even about tithing itself. In Deuteronomy 8, 17, there's that great passage that says, it is the Lord your God that gives you the ability to make wealth. Now think about that just for a moment. It is God who gives you the ability to make money, is what he says in scripture. Plain, plainly cleared out, clears as bell you can get. It's God that gives you ability. Now you may say, oh, you know, well, it's all my ideas. It's all my efforts. It's, it's all my giving. You know, I mean, not my giving, but it's all that I've done, you know, that, that's really made me. I, I'm a self-made man. Well, you know what they say about self-made men? One is that self-made men usually worship their makers and they don't worship God. But the idea is, is that when we really learn it's God who gives us the ability to make money to start with, then really everything we have comes from him. In a nutshell, the logic boils down pretty simple that I have what I have because God's been good to me. I can do what I can do because God's been good to me. I have the ability to do what I do because God's been good to me. That everything I have is because God's given me the ability to do that very thing. 
when I spoke with uh, Pastor Strickland this week about what I'd be sharing on, on, he said, hey, you haven't shared that illustration that you shared years ago when you preached on giving that, that uh, in a long time, at least that I remember, and I'm sure Tim listens to every word I say on Sundays. <laughs> he said that, that illustration, and the illustration was this, and, it, and we could relate to it, especially back when I shared it years ago, because we were in a similar situation. It was about a church who didn't have enough parking place. Now we used to be in a place like that on Rolling Creek for those who are members back there. There wasn't a lot of parking. And we had to park across the street at the grocery store a lot. Well, this church went to the grocery store by them and said, listen, you're not open on Sunday. Can you let us use your parking lot for our services on Sunday? And uh, since it won't interfere with your business. The, the owner of the store said, that is no problem whatsoever. In fact, you can use it every Sunday of the year, but one. To which the pastor said, what do you mean, but one? You don't, you don't open on Sunday. He says, listen, I just want you to remember whose lot it is <laughs> and who it belongs to. When we look at what I, and tie is not nearly as good as word as first fruits. When we look at first fruits giving, that's what it really boils down to. We get the opportunity to remember who it really belongs to. God doesn't need it. God doesn't need my giving, all right? God is pretty self-sufficient, wouldn't you think? He doesn't need it, but yet it's a reminder that I need him. It's a reminder that he is in, in my life, that he's the one who gives me what I have. It's a reminder to put God first. In fact, when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 14, it says this, you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which you shall choose to place his name there and the tithe of the corn and thy wine and thine oil and the firstlings of your herd and your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Just underline that in your Bible, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. We give because it's a reminder that God is in first place in our life, that he is at the center of our life, that he is in charge of our life. The NIV puts it this way, so you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. New American Standard says, in order that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. King James we just read from, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Now, Living Bible is not really a translation, it's a paraphrase, but I do like the way it paraphrased this particular passage. The purpose of your giving, your tithing, is to teach us to put God first in every situation. That's pretty simply put, is it not? Just to teach us to put God first in every situation in our life and all things that occur to us. Now, a reason a lot of people don't tithe, it gets back to that law and grace issue. Well, it was under the law, and when Christ came, the law was fulfilled, so therefore I don't, I don't give a, a first fruits offering anymore. I don't give tithe from the first of my, and, and that really becomes a big excuse for not doing anything, for not participating, for not being a part of what God wants you to do in your life and to put him first in all situations. But I wanna show you something this morning you may not be aware of. I believe that the concept and the idea of first fruit giving was not instituted first and foremost in the law of Moses. I believe it was instituted in the garden. We don't have actual reference to it, but there are things that happen in that first years of, of life after we've been expelled from the garden that lead us to believe that God had somehow given a word or revelation to Adam and Eve, that they'd already seen a demonstration of sacrifice for their sin in the offering, uh, it, by the Lord as an offering, all right, with the, with the innocent animal. But there had to be something that the Spirit of God spoke to them that they taught their children. And I wanna look at that this morning. In fact, there's several instances of what we call pre-law tithing, giving 10% of your income before the law was instituted. You have the illustration of Abraham in scripture, where it says that Abraham gave to Melchizedek his tithe. Now, theologians tell us that Melchizedek was a type of Christ. There's some theologians who believe that it was the pre-incarnate Christ, that Abraham is giving the first fruits of his, of his livelihood to the Lord. Now, by the way, Abraham was not saved by the law. Abraham is saved by grace. As everybody in the New Testament, everybody in the Old Testament, everybody from time that's been saved, been saved not by keeping any religious order, religious laws, even if it's the law of Moses, we're saved by faith and grace, all right? That's the way everybody's saved, it's the way it's always been. And so you understand that 
I believe that men get saved by revelation. All right. God gives a word, reveals his grace to them, reveals his holiness, reveals their sinfulness. And we, we, we surrender to the grace of God in our lives. But I believe there's other principles in scripture that also come by revelation. And I believe this one, the Bible says in Genesis 28, that Jacob promised his first fruits of his life unto the Lord. They go on in scripture, he talks to us about the story of Cain and Abel. Boy, there is a, a, a mystery. When you see these two boys of Adam and Eve come and present their offerings to the Lord. Well, one, where did they get the idea that they're supposed to give an offering to start with? Do you ever worry about, wonder about that? And then why, why do we see this whole thing un, un, just unfold before us and really it could almost be confusing. Now, a lot of people will go back to that and there's a principle which a lot of preachers use that, you know, that, uh, that the only thing that satisfies the righteousness of God is the blood, all right? And that what Abel did is he brought a blood offering to the Lord by the first fruits of his flock and that Cain did not. He just brought a, from his produce and from his land as a farmer. That's what he brought. Now, there's, that's, that's true that we're not saved, you know, there has to be a sacrifice for our sins. But, you know, when you look at, if you look at the offerings of scriptures and this issue of Cain and Abel and start really looking carefully into it, boy, a lot of stuff begins to unfold as you take one scripture, as we talk about comparing scripture with scripture, we begin to see some truths that maybe you might not have been aware of before. Let's just look at what this, how this story unfolds. It says that it, that it came about in the course of time let me just tell you a little bit about that phrase, first of all, in the course of time. Some say the Hebrew would render, at the end of days. What days? It was time for Shabbat. One thing that they knew about in the garden was a seventh day rest. God had instituted, you're not gonna work on the seventh day, right? And so it was the end of days, and it's time to do what? It's time for the day of worship. And to begin this day of worship, what, what happens? Cain and Abel bring an offering to the Lord. What should we always do in, in, our, in our days of worship? It should begin or end at least with an offering unto the Lord, an offering of, and, and, and of worship. And it says, so they, they come to bring their offerings and Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground and Abel brought his part also. He brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord, he had regard for Abel and for his offering. Now, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but obviously there was some kind of sign and symbol that God gave in that moment that he didn't accept that one and he did accept this one, all right? Whether it was smoke going up into heaven or it being consumed like some of the offerings of the Old Testament word, I don't know. But it said he had regard. Then it goes on to say, but Cain and for his offering, the Lord had no regard. That's tough. I mean, the Lord would look at my offering, not have regard for it. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. In other words, he's ticked off and you can tell it. That's what it means, his countenance. He's mad and you know it. Now, a lot of people get mad and you never know it. All right. My wife's good at that. So you've got to be able to read her. You know, you, you may be getting ready to have your head bit off. So you be tread carefully if you can't read the signs. <laughs> She's not in here right now, so I can say that. <laughs> He's mad and he knows. And so here's the Lord. Now, now, this is the beauty. This is the grace of God. God intervenes. God moves in and speaks to Cain. Why are you angry? And why are you showing it? <laughs> why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, in other words, he didn't do something right. Wouldn't you agree? If you do right, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And he said, in other words, if you do the right thing, you don't have to worry about it. But if you start moving in the wrong direction, listen, you're headed for trouble because sin is crouching. It's like a dog getting ready to pounce, a crouching at the door. And you, you better learn to master it. Well, to master certain things in life, we have to master our hearts first. And the only thing that can master our hearts is the master. Amen. That we put him in charge of our life. Now, as you follow the story, through, it gets, it's, 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 it's a marvelous story. You know, in the Bible, uh, when you look at this, there were two kinds of offerings. So my first reading is what's wrong with, what's wrong with his offering? 
Because in, 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 in even on the Mosaic law, there were, there were basically two kinds of offerings that you, you couldn't you couldn't bring. So you have to look at why didn't God receive his offering? Because there's one, the Minka offering, and then there's the Zebok offering. One's a, a sacrificial offering, which is usually bloodless, bloodless and voluntary. The Zebok offering is a blood offering, a sacrificial offering. And both offerings were acceptable in, in, in situations, all right? And there's not a, you know. In fact, in Deuteronomy 26, 11, it said that their offering could be either one. But what happens? Cain, look at how many, he brings the fruit of his fields. All right. He brings the fruit of his field, but he didn't bring the first fruits. Abel brought the best, the first, and the fattest, it says. Now look at Hebrews 11, because we need to compare the Old Testament with the New Testament. And look what Hebrews 11 says. You with me? By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and being dead, he yet speaks. Now, the word here where it says more excellent, that had gotten anything to do in the Greek language, the word is enthusiasm. And the word enthusiasm has to do not with quantity, I mean with quality, like what type was, but has to do everything with quantity. So if we're going to look at literal scripture, the scripture says that God is pleased by Abel's offering because he presented it by faith and he presented the right amount. I mean, that's what, that's what it literally says. He was more pleased. Why was God pleased with it? Because it was a more excellent offering. It was the right offering. It was the right amount. It was the right kind of offering that he brought. And again, look at, when you look at the language of scripture in the New Testament, the Greek language, it do, doesn't have to do with, 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 with how, 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 what the quality was. It has everything to do with what the quantity is. Which means what? Which means he gave the portion that honored the Lord, the portion that the Lord expected, the portion that the Lord revealed. You see, how do you know the Lord revealed it to him? Hebrews eleven four. By faith. Faith comes from what? Hearing the word of God. So in other words, tithing is revelation giving in its purest first baby infant forms. It's the first part. It's where we start. That's the first, faith comes by hearing. So in other words, Cain's doing what has been told him, what he knows is the word of God, what's been revealed to him and what he should bring. And he move, he's not moving out of obligation. That's where a lot of people think tithing is. He's moving, he's moving out of grace. He's moving in faith. He believes God. He believes God's word. He's received the word. And so he, in honor and obedience and in trust, it says by faith, he offers this gift to the Lord of the first fruits. Cain, what's he bringing? It doesn't say first fruits. It doesn't say the first of his land. It just says he brought some good stuff from his crops. I mean, it's probably, probably the best even. He might've been the very best of his crops, but it wasn't the first fruits. He said, I just don't know if I believe that. I think we have to look at the scripture and be honest with ourselves about the scripture. It, it, th there's a revelation that's been given to Adam, to Eve, to Cain, to Abel, just down the line that we honor the Lord. In fact, if you look at the Greek Septuagint translation of this verse and, and the way it's written, uh, the Septuagint version of the Bible was the Greek translation of the Hebrew. It was made 200 years before the, before the birth of Christ, all right? And when you take that translation and translate it to English, look how the verse translates into English at this point from Genesis 4. Let me go on past that. We already talked about that. Said, the Septuagint says in verse, chapter, verse 6 and 7, chapter 4, Why are you become sorrowful? Why has your countenance fallen? Have you not sinned? Thou hast brought it rightly, but not rightly divided it. You did the right thing in bringing it. You didn't bring it right. It's right to offer to the Lord, but it's not right to offer to the Lord what you want to offer. It's right to offer to the Lord what God wants you to offer. In fact, in the book of Jude, this book on apostasy, as Paul is railing against the apostates, he said, they have gone the way of Cain. Cain's idea was religion however I want it. Whatever makes me happy. Whatever fulfills me. I know God wants me happy. I know God wants me blessed. So I'm going to be spiritual. But it rejects the headship and the lordship and the word of God. It turns its back on those things and doesn't accept the revelation of truth in Scripture. So Cain's sin was not in was not in not bringing an offering to the Lord. He obviously brings an offering to the Lord, but why is it? It's not. It wasn't first fruits. The first fruits. 
So mark the difference, because when you look at the scripture in Genesis, one says he brought the fruit of the ground, Cain. Abel brought the firstlings of his fruit, the firstlings of his flock. The first offering of Abel is an acknowledgement that God was everything, that God's word was right and that he loved God and so he'd obey God. Now, what we have to be cautious of is being guilty of the same thing. I'll come to church, I'll present my offering that I want to present, that I think is right, that I feel is good. And we pretty much fall in the same categories. So I just know if I'm not, I don't know if I'm convinced of this thing about Cain and Abel. Well, let's go one more thing. <laughs> the early church fathers, all right, they all agreed that this incident about Cain and Abel and the murder was all related to tithing. Now, remember, this is not the law of Moses yet. We haven't even heard about the law of Moses. This is all pre the law of Moses. All right. And so people say, well, I don't believe tithes on the law. No, there's a tithe before the law. Clement of Rome, one of the first century pastors in Rome, he said, you know, Cain's sin, not in bringing first fruits, is what it's all about. Second century pastor Arrhenius wrote, the difference that eight was Abel brought the tithe of a flock, Cain didn't bring a tenth of the crop. Hillary, bishop of Portsmouth in the fourth century, maintained that this showed that tithe must have begun in Eden with this understanding of scripture. Hugo Abbott of St. Victor's and then Peter Comstar in the 12th century both said God had respect toward Abel's offering because it was a tithe, because it was first fruits, because what God had desired and what God had revealed to him to give. I mean, think about it for a moment. As long as time has existed, one seventh of that time is dedicated to the Lord as individuals. We honor the Lord on the Lord's day. It's a day unto the Lord. As long as men has had material possessions from the garden as we see now, God has reserved one-tenth of that which he has bestowed upon man to be given back as an offering of faith and worship to honor God. That's the beginning. Then you get into tithing under the law of Moses. And tithing under the law of Moses is different from this pre-law tithe. In fact, it was a second and a third tithe added to that tithe. The second tithe was instituted to basically to finance the three, fe three of the feasts of Israel. Deuteronomy 12 says it was to finance the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Pentecost. In the law, there was a third tithe also. In Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29, it talks about a tithe that would be set aside for the strangers and the fatherless and the widows. And that was taken only on your increase in the third year. So there were tithes that were established under Moses, but they were a second and a third tithe. Galatians 3 tells us that the, the law was added until the seed, which is Jesus, would come. All right? So when Jesus comes and fulfills the law, what happens? The second tithe and the third tithe, the Mosaic tithes, were no longer responsible for those. All right? The first two passed away and Christ rose from the dead. Now, the first, I mean, number two and three, the first, however, is still effect because it wasn't under the law. It wasn't part of the law of Moses that the scripture talks about. You say, well, uh, I just think it's the law. There's some things that were obvious before the law was given. You know, the Ten Commandments that says, you know, there's no God, you have no other God before you, right? You don't commit murder, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't, you know, steal your neighbor's wife, all those things. So since the law is passed now, all right, does that mean I can have my neighbor's wife? Or I can steal? Or I can lie? Or I can commit murder? No, because there is what we would call God's moral law that is obvious from the revelation of scriptures that we have. But one of the things I believe is part of that that is so often overlooked, that if we're going to worship God, part of the act of worship is honoring God, not just with my praise and my adoration in my lips, or even serving him in some capacity, but it also affects my income, the blessings that God has given me in my life, that I'll honor him with those things. There was a tithe before the law, during the law, and still after the law. Jesus told the Pharisees under the law, hey, you should tithe. So that's point number one in dealing with pre-law tithing, all right? That it's not just a mosaic issue here. It's a biblical issue 
and an act of worship, which God has called his people into, whereby he says it proves, number one, who owns you. In fact, that really is the, the ultimate of what I want to make in point two. It teaches us, if we can learn, and let's get away even from the word tithing. If we can just learn first fruits giving, that we give first fruits to the Lord, then it begins to teach us the, the meaning of genuine stewardship. The Bible says the tithe is holy unto the Lord. In other words, it belongs to God. I can give God my time, and we ought to. I can give God my talents, and I should. I can give God, you know, serving him in some regard, and I should. But also, the Bible has it placed upon me, Old Testament and New Testament, the first day of the week, that I should lay aside according to how God has prospered me. So how do, how do I know what that is? What's the standard? He's, well, I've prospered lots of good life. Well, in, in, in a nutshell, that kind of brings that, but at least there's a starting part to show you with how much at least you ought to be giving. And there's that where that 10% comes in. And by the way, according to scripture, the tithe is really not mine anyway, is it? It's not an obligation. It's just a responsibility. It belongs to God. I, I, I can't give it to him if it's already his, can I? It's not ours. <laughs> I'm just surrendering to him. And I, I bring it to his storehouse. And if I don't, then I'm keeping something that's not really mine. It's holy unto the Lord. So if your giving doesn't include at least 10%, you don't understand the very basic children's premise. I like Bill, Bill Stafford said, baby giving. <laughs> you know, that part of it, you're missing the mark. What happens if I keep it? Well, Malachi, the prophet said, if you keep it, then you're stealing it. Because it's not yours to keep. You stole it. So this morning, if I choose not to give first fruits offerings to the Lord and I choose to keep it, then I'm stealing it because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord because he's first in my life. It's evidence that he's first in my life. It's proof of my love for him that he's first in my life. So I, I give this at least to begin with. It's the starting place in my, my journey of understanding financial victory and financial freedom in my life. And I give it to him and I put it in his storehouse, but for whatever purpose he desires it for Deuteronomy 14, I read earlier, it's just a reminder that God is first in every situation. And let me remind you again, God, God's not poor. All right? And I, by the way, let me, let me remind you as well as your pastor, I don't get your tithe. So don't give it to me. People come in all the time, uh, here's my tithe. What give it to me for? <laughs> there's, a, there's a place of worship by the door there. You can place it in that box right there. It's, it, it belongs to the Lord. And it goes to the storehouse and there's decisions are made by leadership, where that's going, how it's spent, how we minister to other people. Matthew 22, when Jesus is talking to the, to the Pharisees, remember they came and they're trying to entrap him. And, and, and they, of course, you never could trap Jesus, but they, they showed him the coin of Caesar. And Jesus said to them that great response, you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. That's whose image is on there. But you render unto the things, the things that are God. Well, there's so many lessons and so many sermons there. The image of Caesar was on the coin. Who bears God's image? We do. All right. We're made in the image of God. So we give ourselves to God and giving ourselves to God. Then 10 percent is not a big deal anymore, is it? I mean, it's, it's not the issue that we would try to make it out to be. It's just that we give it. It says so there may be meat in my house so we can do the ministries that God wants us to do. It's given unto the Lord. It's that first step. But third thing I want to show you this morning about tithing is this. It is the gateway. It's the open door. It's the first steps to genuine blessings of a guy, God on our life. It's never meant to be this obligatory thing. It's meant to be an act of worship whereby we honor the Lord. It's that place where we come to worship God. Boy, I love Malachi 3, even though he's dealing with the law, the issue of the law, the people, the principles are still, you know, can be applied to your life. Of the, and that's the beautiful thing about scripture all through it. Paul said, those things happen to them for an example for us. There's things we can learn from those people. And in Malachi he said, listen, you have been robbing God. I mean, it's hard to think that you may have driven here, driven to here this morning in a car you stole from God. Amen. You just hadn't paid your tithe, you went and bought you a new car. That's God's car. Amen. You stole it. Some of you this morning wearing stolen clothes. I just had to have that, Brother Joe. I know I couldn't give this week because I had to have that. You're wearing stolen shoes, you know? Because he said, you've robbed God, you know? Now, I don't know about you. Last thing I want to be called is a God robber. Hey, there's arms. He's a God robber. 
there's, there's issues of personal integrity that I think that also include here. I don't want to be known as that guy. When I stand before God, walk into my kingdom. Sorry, there's no crowns for you, God, Robert, but you're saved. <laughs> By the way, we're going to be talking about crowns on Wednesday night. So come back Wednesday night. We'll be talking about some of those things in the, in the Bema seat. Some great truths for us there. He said, listen, if we, when you learn to do this, he said, what are you? And he said, you are proving that God's your father. Here's an evidence. You're going to open up the windows of heaven. I'll rebuke the devourer. I, I, I'm going to cause people to, to look at you. I'm going to make you such a delightsome land, it says, that people will look at you and glorify God. He said, God said, I'm going to put you on display when you learn how to honor me the right way. And I'll rebuke the devourer. So understand that it is the gateway. It's, just, it's the first door we come through to get in to the glorious blessings of in a financial way. Now, and I'm not preaching prosperity doctrine. You know, that's out there. You know, just name it, claim it, frame it, whatever you want. Just ask God, tell God, claim it, say it real loud, say it often, and you'll get it. All right? That doesn't work. Say, how do you know? I tried it. I tried it for weeks. Cadillac, 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 Cadillac. <laughs> Cadillac, Cadillac, Cadillac. Maybe, maybe God doesn't like Cadillacs. I Mercedes. 500 S, please. <laughs> you know, that's just the root of selfishness is what really gets exposed with that, in that, that theater of doctrine, does it not? Uh, just how self-centered and idol worshiping we are. If you really want to read the truth of it, read everything about apostasy and you'll see that doctrine gets real prominent in the apostate theology that the scripture has to talk about. People who, who think that godliness is gain. But you have to understand, God does want to bless your life. God does want to do something in your life. God doesn't want you bound up. God doesn't want you to be afraid every month of, and not being able to make the end so-called meet. But it starts here with giving. And I have people all the time, but Brother Joe, how can I give when I can't afford to give? You can't afford not to. And this is where, this is where you, you know, do I really believe that God's supernatural? And I get presented situations, it's hard sometimes. Somebody says, hey, this is all I've got and I'm an independent and I don't make a lot of money and I'm on social security, whatever it might be. I just don't think I can do this. The worst thing I could tell somebody like, oh, don't do it. You can't afford to do that and have sympathy. You know, that's, that's, that's not real sympathy and that's not real love. Real love is to say, well, do you do what you can't do and see what God does? Yes, amen. Remember the widow who came and cast in the offerings that she had? Jesus is standing obviously by the offering buckets. He's standing over and against the treasury, it said. All right. I don't know where he's standing this morning. If he's standing there, just make sure you put in what you're supposed to put. All right. <laughs> But he's standing there and he's watching what everybody's putting in. I make you in the mind of God, who knows? But then that little lady comes up and puts in out of her need. And some of you this morning, tithing is giving out of your need. Some of you are giving more than your tithing is giving out of your need. But I think that translates in a lot of ways. The lesson I think that Phil and I learned in those early days, which we tried to teach our family and children, was if you got a need, it's time to give. It's not a time to wait and get. Well, Brother Joe, I'm in a time of healing. You've been there most of your life. <laughs> you know, you've got to be in a time of giving before you can ever get to the time of receiving. And it starts here. This is just something that he says, I'll keep the windows open. I'll keep the air flowing in. I'll keep the supply coming down from heaven. My God shall supply all your needs according to riches and glory. That was the, the scripture last week, remember? But it was based upon the premise that they were honoring God with what they had. The rewards are immense. Which brings us to number four and then quickly to number five. Four is this. It costs more if you disobey. Malachi put it this way. Said, You're cursed with a curse. You know? Why? I said, because you're just robbing God. Therefore, you, you know, uh, you're cursed with a curse. We've said before, you know, everybody ties, some just get it collected. Remember the story of Jericho when the people went in and they conquered the land? And remember, God said, leave everything there. The rest of the land is yours. What was Jericho? Jericho was the first fruits. It was the tithe. All right. Everything in the land is yours. You have it all. But Jericho belongs to me. So don't touch anything. Achan couldn't help himself. He saw some nice threads. Nice Babylonian garment, and I'm sure it was pretty, but he couldn't wear it. <laughs> All right, he had to hide it in his tent. He stole some gold, he took a wedge of gold, wood, silver, buried it in his tent. The next place they go, what happened? 
They'd met death at the door. They should have been able to conquer this little city of Ai. 36 soldiers die. Warriors lose their life. They come back there in a great morning. They've been whipped by this little place. They don't know what's going on. And God says, reason, reason you not got the blessings of God on you because you stole from me. I told you not to take anything. And, and you took it. And they bring everybody out and line them up. All right. We just lost this battle because somebody here robbed God. Achan was brought before him and his whole family lost their lives ultimately. Cursed with curse and caused everybody else around him to be cursed with curse. Cursed his family because he was selfish and greedy. He just had to have a little something, a little more, a little proof, a little evidence. Hey, I'm blessed. Achan sin was, and, and literally calls it the accursed thing. In other words, the, the, the tithe, the first fruits offerings are a blessing if you give them. They're a curse if you keep them. And it costs more. The fifth point is simple. It's just the beginning point. It's just the starting place. That's where we start the journey into spirit-filled giving. That's where we learn to realize that God is much greater and that, the, you know, that if we're faithful and little, we can be master over much. But it's not that we could just get for ourselves. It's not about this prospering, you getting rich mindset. It's about you making a difference in the world, about you being a giver, that your life means something to other people. It means something to the kingdom of God. It means something to the world around you. I mean, there has to be some point in your life where you got enough, right? I mean, how much is enough? And you realize that God's putting things at my disposal in my life to be used for something greater. And if I begin to realize that, then I also begin to discover that I begin now to use what I have and what God's given me, the capacity to receive and what I receive is a blessing from him. Now I'm partnering with God in greater vision in greater truths and greater things and missions and making difference in people's lives. I think all too often we, we think the, the purpose of the tithe, tithing is just somehow to secure tithe. No, the purpose of tithing is to secure you, you know? You're in God's hands and you're at God's disposal. And ultimately, this whole thing was brought up as what? It says at the end of days, they came to worship God. Your giving is worship. It's a concrete expression. I love you, God. That my life is not about some cold legalistic submission to rules and order. It's about loving you, Jesus. Honoring you with what you've given me. And being used by you. And the more that I learned this principle, and the more I learned about giving and receiving, I can continue to give. Now, there is a warning that's applied to this, all right? The warning is simple. If you pay tithe, just increase your income. Or get a pat on the back to praise a man. Or just doing out of grudging out of fear, making God mad, or any other reason, don't expect much pleasure in it or much blessing of it. The Apostle Paul said, listen, this is 2 Corinthians 8, and it really gives the heartbeat of what I'm talking about in regard to this pleasure versus obligation. You know, he says, your giving is to prove the sincerity of your love. It's just, it's evidence that you really do love God. It's just, a, it's, it's proof. It's kind of like you put your money where your mouth is or put your money where your heart is. Because where a man's heart is, that's where his treasure is. So you're putting your heart out there before law. I am under grace. And if I'm under grace, I believe it calls for more. Because I understand he that's given everything to me, how can I not give him more? How can I not love more? How can I not care more? How can I not be like that woman who took that costly bottle of perfume and broke it over the feet of Jesus and poured it out over there over his feet and just worshiped him with that? I think at some point, and let me just put it in these words, we have to learn to translate the love of our heart into something tangible. It can expressed in our gifts. It's expressed in our actions. It's expressed in our words in every level. I believe God does want to bless you more than you probably realize. I do that. I know he's blessed me more than I could possibly realize. I mean, I, I stand back in awe many times. I, I looked in the mirror last night, honestly. And every once in a while I have a little chat with myself. Y'all don't do that? It's best in the mirror too. Because I like to see the expressions while I'm talking to myself. <laughs> and I said, and you're looking at the wrinkles and in the sink at some of the hair. And I said, in just a few days, about 10 days from now, you're going to be 63. That's what I said, wow. 
And I thought back just, I mean, just in that moment, I just thought of all the times over all the years I've known Jesus that I was afraid that something wasn't going to work or that God might not come through or something might not take place or how is this going to turn out or all that. And I just gave a big old smile. I said, you really work. I have this long history of facts. Got some failures as well. And some of you do as well. And some of you are just starting your journey. I hope the day you look in the mirror and you say, well, you're 63, 73, 93, you'll say, he really works. He really does everything he said he'd do. I keep responding to the revelation of grace, operating in faith, see what God does. God's been really, really, really good to me. I haven't been without heartaches, just as your journey hasn't been. I haven't been without losses, just as your journey hasn't been. But man, God's been good to you, has he not? And he says, you just give to prove the sincerity of your love. That's just a way that you can express your love to God. And you can't serve God and mammon. Jesus said that. But you can serve God with mammon. You can serve God with what you make. And one thing that giving does, it helps lift us up out of our sordid, selfish lifestyles. To learn what it means to live and really live because we're not about us anymore. Result of Cain's life, misery, death, pain, sorrow, rest of his life. What's it going to be? Now again, this is just a starting point. It's the first steps. But it's grace for us. And we can give graciously because we've experienced the grace of God. Would you stand with your heads bowed?